This is 99% Invisible. I'm Roman Mars. Rock, Paper, Scissors is an elegant game dating back a couple thousand years. It hasn't always been rock, paper, or scissors, but the principles were always the same. Conflicting items in opposition, thrown by hand, simultaneously, with a zero-sum outcome. You win, you lose, you draw. It's so simple and straightforward that anyone can understand it and play it, which is why it has spread everywhere in the world. The only non-intuitive aspect is the fact that paper beats rock, which defies our lived experience with both papers and rocks. But I am not here to nitpick. For as long as rock, paper, scissors has existed, it's been useful as a peaceful way to settle disputes. It's not as random as a coin toss because you're playing against another human. It has enough randomness to feel fair, but enough skill to feel satisfying. Which leads us to one of the most high stakes game of rock, paper, scissors I've ever heard of. Reported by our own Joe Rosenberg originally for the brilliant, brilliant show, Snap Judgment. Here's Joe Rosenberg. So our story is gonna start with this guy. Good Lord, I'm practically making love to this microphone now. His name is Jonathan Rendell. I'm a deputy chairman of Christie's in America who spent a lot of his time in the late 80s, early 90s, selling material to Japan. Material, meaning art. And in the mid-90s to the mid-2000s, going back to Japan to get everything back um, that I'd sold to them 10 years before. The extraordinary thing was you'd go to a trunk room, which looks like that last scene in the Raiders of the Lost Ark. You know, there's things in boxes going on forever. Um, and open a box, and in the box would be a work of art or several works of art, and you'd pick the object up and you'd look on the back of it and you'd find your handwriting from 10 years ago. That's so surreal. It really is like kind of this weird ebb and flow of prestige between people, and and so long as you're the middleman, um, you know, uh, you'll be all right in the end. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) The beauty of the bubble market. But of course, Christie's did not have this wonderful pie all to itself. It's a market that is really a duopoly between two auction house giants. There's Christie's and then there's the other place. You mean Sotheby's? Yeah. It's like saying my opponent instead of, yeah. No, that's actually how one normally refers to it, the other place. So it's sort of uh, friendly-ish rivalry. I wouldn't say it was entirely friendly. And Sotheby's and Christie's, you see, there was one collection they both had their eyes on. The Masprodenko corporate collection was, a, was a, a, a jewel in the crown. It had everything that one wanted to sell at that precise moment. You know, the, the Cezanne, the Picasso, the Van Gogh, their, their trophy names. And, most importantly... It was $20 million worth of business. There was just one problem. Mr. Hashiyama, the CEO who had founded the collection, he was really chummy with Sotheby's. They'd known him for years. If Christie's wanted that $20 million worth of business, they were going to have to win him over. It was a very, very hard job for me, Mr. Hashiyama. This is Kanai Ishibashi. She worked at Christie's Tokyo office alongside Jonathan. Just think of her as the client whisperer. She'd been paying visits to Mr. Hashiyama since almost her first day on the job. But he'd been proving tricky. He really doesn't sort of talk about um, business. We talked about art and music and, you know, his great passion for dinosaurs. You know, we, 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 we could spend hours laughing. So he told me that when his company was listed in, in a stock market, which was a very, very important incident, he chose the insurance company um, by throwing dice. Yeah. Yes. So I, when, when I heard that story, I was I found it really funny. And, you know, he he's a bit sort of eccentric and all that. But we couldn't really read where he his mind was. First of all, how many how many over how many years were you doing this? I think we'd spent six years. Um, six years? Yeah, meeting with Mr. Hashiyama before the auction. That's incredible. And meanwhile, though, um, you, you're not the only person meeting with him, I, I would take it. No, 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 no. S- Sotheby's, they were there all the time. 
And after both houses had finally given their big presentations on why Mr. Hashiyama should choose them and not, you know, the other place. He came back with this extraordinary request. I received a call from Mr. Hashiyama in the office. And he said in order to determine um, which auction house to handle collection, I would like both of you, Christie's and Sotheby's, to play the game Rock, Paper, Scissors. Yes, you heard her right. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Mr. Hashiyama wanted the two biggest auction houses in the world to play a $20 million game of Rochambeau. I, I think there was a moment, a, a moment of silence and surprise. And then... What? That's it. I, 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 I didn't really reply back to him. I couldn't really answer him, like, why are you doing this? And, you know, we, we can't really do that. I, I, I couldn't believe it. You know, we didn't know what to do. But it was very clear that it was, it was a very serious request from the client. Um, and so when a client asks you to do something, you just get on and do it. Here's how it would work. Each side, Christie's and Sotheby's, would have the weekend to come up with their choice of quote-unquote weapon. Then, on Monday morning, they would meet at the Mass Prodenko offices in Tokyo, and there, they would duel. This was one game, and Kanai's job was to write down one word on a piece of paper. And that word had to be either rock or paper or scissors. So we started compulsively playing rock, paper, scissors, trying to work out how do we win this? Is there some secret to this? How bad are you going to feel? How idiotic are you going to look in front of your your colleagues when you've lost a collection for, for a child's game? I don't really remember those those three days. I mean, I was, uh, I was under enormous pressure to think what would be the best strategy. But my struggle was always that I knew that there is no strategy because it's it's just a pure chance. So constantly, whenever I had some moment on a train or walking in the streets, I I, I suddenly sort of thought about rock, paper, scissors. I had to contemplate uh, between choices. I think it's paper. No, 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 I think it's rock. Then I said, no, 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 no. I I shouldn't do it because there is no answer. There is no answer. Let's stop. But then, even though I tried not to think about it, I couldn't really forget about rock, paper, scissors from my mind. Do you think Mr. Hashiyama, do you think he was like just like sitting back, rubbing his hands together like mischievously? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I really don't know. And meanwhile, of course, she was getting all kinds of advice. Every time I walked past Kanai, I was constantly like, why do we go with rock? You know, it's the, it's the strong thing. And then there was this guy. Uh, my name's Nate McLean her boss, at the Christie's offices in New York. Where we ran the Impressionist and Modern Art Department. Did you have uh, an opinion about which to choose? No, but obviously the first thing I did when I got home, I was telling my wife about this. And my daughters. I'm Flora. I'm Alice. They were 11 then. They're 20 now. And the fun fact about them is... We are twins. Are you identical twins? Yeah, very identical. One's left-handed, one's right-handed. Mirror twins. And we were in the kitchen of our home in New York, and he was saying, I've got a bit of an issue. Sotheby's is going to get the steal. We were like, oh, yeah, we hate Sotheby's. And they came back to me quite promptly and said, yeah, Dad, everybody knows you start with scissors. Yeah, scissors is the pretty standard move. So I said, well, how does that work? And they said, well... Most people like the idea of going with with rock. But because they were like super clever Sotheby's, we're like, oh, they're going to bluff. So Sotheby's would choose paper. But you then double bluff by getting scissors and scissors cuts paper. And I said, all right, that sounds good. I said, what if they go scissors? They said, you go scissors again. Because that's what I do. Yeah, you just stick with scissors and see what happens. At which point, Nick called up Kanai. And he said, Kanai, scissors. I think scissors... Uh, is, is a thing. 
And at that point, we get into the theater of the absurd. You know, we're, we're about to do this massive piece of business and we're, we're listening to the advice of 11 year olds. Would you, would you have been willing to go with uh, Alison Flores' choice, uh, regardless of what it would have been? Would, would, would that have struck you as like a... At least, I, at least I'd have had someone else to blame if it was wrong. But I wouldn't feel with my gut that, that you know, scissors are the best choice. Or rather, I would say, um, I reached to the point where I, the situation got beyond my capacity. I think I didn't quite sleep a few days. But on that Sunday um, evening, I, I slept for a few hours. And then suddenly, uh, my husband came up in my dream. He said, can I? And he told me what choice I should come up with. Then I woke up and I, I, I saw the window and the sky was beginning to light up. I didn't look at the time, but I felt really sort of refreshed. Somehow, my husband's voice really struck me and I I didn't even think about, you know, right or wrong, but I felt that it was a choice for me and I would go for it. So, Monday morning... The car comes to pick me up with her in it, and we start driving off towards the Masprodenko office. And did she tell you what she decided? No. She didn't? No, she was keeping her cards very close to her chest. Did you pro, pro, prod her, like, oh, come on, can I just tell me? What, yeah, of what course, you but, you know, you try and get a secret out of her, she won't tell you. At that point, would you have... Um... Happily got out of the car and walked away, yes. Um, so, Why would you want to walk away, though? I feel like the tension might be unbearable, but how could you possibly not want to be there in that room? Yeah, but it might be it might be like, like watching a kitten being steamrolled as well, because if the pressure was big on me, it was absolutely massive on her. So she had prepared herself and was sort of entering a, a semi-zen state. So we arrive, we're shown to a waiting room, then... The two people from Sotheby's arrive. Do you uh, recognize the two people from Sotheby's? Yeah, you know, I knew who I knew who they were. Um, but it's it's hardly the moment for you know. Hi, how are you? Um, more sort of a grunt. So we sit one side of the table. They sit the other side of the table, and there are two accountants and a fax machine. And somewhere on the other side of the fax machine, Mr. Hashiyama himself, waiting for the results. And we're told to write down the word. And Jonathan actually looked at me, and beneath the table, he showed me rock um, with his hand. And um, his eyes were very sharp. And he nodded to me once. I think he nodded for, to, to make sure that it was, a, it was a good decision. And she's just saying nothing, so... Nothing. Nothing. And she goes ahead and writes down a word. Can you see what word she wrote? It's in kanji. I don't read Japanese. But looking at the face of the accountant holding the piece of paper, you could tell nothing. He was totally inscrutable. He looks at it for what was probably 30 seconds, and your your heart's in your mouth. And then Maspro person um, opened the envelope, and he, he said, Sotheby's, paper, Christie's, scissors. And then they look at Can I and say, you won. And it was like a huge, a huge weight had gone off her shoulders. But after we went outside the building, we, we screamed. Saved by Can I. Completely saved by Can I. Would you be deputy chairman of Christie's if uh, if if you if you had gone for Rock? Uh, no, I suspect I might still be there, but I probably wouldn't be quite where I am now. Really, it really would have had that kind of effect. It would have been a it's a huge career block. You just lost a great big deal. Obviously, he should have come to us first. You never go paper. Paper just sounds that it's not going to win. It's a weak move. Wait, 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 wait. why not paper? Because the other person's going to stick with scissors. It's just a weak move. Whether Mr. Hashiyama himself would agree with that, we don't know. But Kanai would meet him again at the art auction in New York. And normally, you know, clients, they demand the very best restaurants in New York. But he said, well, I won't have a steak. 
So we went to um, to the real sort of New York steak steakhouse, having crumb chowder and and steak together, and it was a very simple dinner, but it was very nice. Did he ever talk about rock paper scissors again, or did you ever bring it up? No, he never brought it up, and I didn't talk about it. But two years later, uh, Mr. Hashima um, passed away, and that was the last time I saw him. Today, Kanai Ishibashi has quit the auction business entirely. She now runs a music school with her husband in Tokyo. And as for Nick's twin daughters, Alice and Flora, shortly after the art auction, Time Magazine ran a section called Quotes of the Week. The Pope was there, Arnold Schwarzenegger, I think the President, and Alice McLean. She has it framed. Yep, it's framed. (laughs) In the house. (laughs) What was her quote? Everybody knows you go scissors. This story was first reported by Karen Vogel at the New York Times, and Joe Rosenberg first produced it for Snap Judgment, a show that I love, love, love. We'll have a link to Snap and the original Times article on our website. Coming up after the break, in the Marvel movie Shang-Chi, there's an epic fight on a runaway bus careening down the hills of San Francisco. It is a great scene that we will make even better when we have an SF Muni bus driver tell you how that would really go down after this. extremely grateful that podcasting is as popular as it is. I get to have this career talking to you. It's the best. But with the rise of podcasting comes an unexpected side effect. The sudden appearance of characters in movies and TV that are podcasters. They're usually played for laughs as one-dimensional parodies. I really don't care. I find it fun. I'm totally into it. That show, Only Murders in the Building, it is great. It is so funny. Not one second of it resembles actual podcasting, but I do not care at all. It is a delightful show. But there's one thing that does stick out to me when a podcaster is shown on screen that bugs me just a little bit, and it is this. They never know how to hold a microphone. In the real world, if you're recording anything, you generally have to be in a quiet place, and you have to put the mic right next to the sound. When you mic your voice, the mic is right next to your face. Fictional podcasters usually have bad mics and they're pointed in random directions, far away from the source of sound. Plus, they often record narration in noisy environments, like when they're driving a car. It's just ridiculous. And when the mic is in the wrong place on screen, it's kind of all I can see. I'm not so much of a grumpy pedant that, you know, it ruins anything for me, but it's just where my mind goes. I watch movies from the perspective of a podcaster. I assume this is true for almost any profession, be it a police officer or a doctor or a city bus driver, which leads me to one of my favorite things to ever happen on Twitter. A couple months ago, San Francisco Muni bus driver Mac Allen tweeted one of the all-time great Twitter threads dissecting the thrilling runaway bus fight scene in Marvel's Shang-Chi. To begin with, I should say that Mac loves this whole action sequence, but like all movies, they took some liberties when it came to accurately depicting the operation of a San Francisco Muni bus. So I asked him to come on the show to talk to me about it. So the action in the scene really starts when Shang-Chi is surrounded by bad guys trying to grab his magical necklace and he summons all of his power and he punches one of them in the chest. And the bad guy flies back like 10 feet. And what do you write about this, Sean? This is the moment as a bus operator I pop my parking brake and open the doors. (laughs) Once you have a fight on the bus, you don't want the bus to be moving and you want people to be able to get off. This is bus operator Mac Allen talking me through some of the highlights of his Twitter thread. Then we see somebody is recording a video of the fight. Yo, what up, y'all? It's your boy Clev coming at you live on the bus. I actually did take a little bit of martial arts as a youth, so I'm gonna try and grade this fight as we're going. It's my opinion that this would definitely happen, for sure, as soon as there's a fight on the bus. People are going to be taking video. (laughs) Then the action ratchets up another level when the main antagonist in the fight reveals his energy sword arm, a character named Razor Fist, and he literally is cutting through the floor of the bus. As a bus operator, I'm looking at this and I see that he's got non-slip 
boots that look like they're really excellent for you know, working on a bus. So that's my comment on, on uh, Razor Fist is good shoes for a fight. And he actually cuts through the floor of the bus and cuts through the air hose that feeds the air brakes for the bus. Then we get to see uh, my hero of the, the scene, the bus operator, uh, maybe a little bit of a bumbling anti-hero, um, Michael Anthony Taylor, uh, who is wearing earphones, is pushing on the pedal of the brake, the treadle, and the bus will not stop. He actually takes out his earphones and throws them away. And this is where I start to hold the bus operator responsible for everything that goes wrong from here on out. Uh, so one, he shouldn't be wearing headphones. You know, that's not allowed at Muni. We're not allowed to have any personal electronic devices on our person in any way. And we're certainly not allowed to muffle sounds that we might yeah. need to hear. And you mentioned that the brake pedal is called a treadle. I, I'd never heard that term. Yeah. Before. There's a bunch of weird sort of inherited terms. I think some of them actually come from like the early days of railroads. Mm -hmm. um, our schedules are called paddles and the brake is called a treadle. They are different than the hydraulic brakes in a car. The emergency function of it fails safe in a very important way that we as bus operators have to be aware of all the time because uh, if that fail safe engages when we aren't ready for it, it could be very dangerous. Hmm. So air brakes actually have a, a fail safe called the spring brake, which is a physical lever that will engage into the brakes to stop the wheels from turning. And that spring brake is held open, not engaging on the wheel by air pressure. So we right. use air pressure to engage the regular brake, the service brake that actually we use to like slow the bus and stop the bus in normal service. And that is engaged by adding air pressure to the service brake. The spring brake is held open by that same air pressure. So if you lose air pressure, then the spring brake, which is a physical spring pushes on it, will engage the brakes. We really don't want that to happen normally while the bus is in motion because it will violently and immediately stop the bus. Um, <laughs> it's not something that comes on slowly, it comes on yeah. at once. Um, yeah. and so we actually have a audible and visual warning for low air pressure that alerts us before the spring break is actually going to engage. Yeah, yeah. So there's air pressure in the system that makes the normal way we think of as a brake work, work by right. you, you uses pressure. It makes a brake pads go against wheels and then it slows down. But if the pressure is cut, if little razor arm cuts through the hose, yeah. then it, then it releases all the air from the system. And then this spring brake system activates and then it's physically impossible for the wheels to move at that point. The bus just stop. It's a dead, it's dead. And That's it right. doesn't move. Yeah. That bus is not so, moving. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 it, and it doesn't matter if you're uh, at the very peak of California pointing down, it's not going anywhere. That's right. And that's a perfect place to resume the thread because that's where we find ourselves uh, on the one California. And actually, this is an excellent point about the scene is that the bus that they're using for the one California is a diesel hybrid articulated motor coach. Um, and the actual One California is a trolley coach. Mm -hmm. It uses uh, trolley poles to draw electricity from the overhead wires. Um, and yeah. we never see any overhead wires in Shang-Chi. Um, I think because the overhead wires would legitimately be a very dangerous thing to try and film around um, mm -hmm. if you're doing stunt driving. Trolley so can... coaches everywhere are offended that, that they've been... They've been uh, sidelined right. side this way. <laughs> I love trolley coaches, but I don't drive them. You mentioned that it was articulating, which means that it's one of those buses that has like two sections of the bus and a little accordion thing between them so that it can be a very long bus and still navigate, you know, normal size streets. In bus operator parlance, we call those Artics, um, which is just short for articulated. <laughs> a lot of people like to call them bindi buses. My kids call them bindi buses. Um, they're called accordion buses, and some people also call them slinky buses. Well, they're all delightful, whatever their name. So the scene goes on, and your commentary continues. And there are parts where you, you know, 
lay a little more blame on the bus driver for not wearing a seatbelt and such. And you heap like some unexpected praise on how well Aquafina can operate the bus and also use the little lever that opens the front and back doors, which I learned from you is a pretty tricky thing to do. And it's all really fun to talk about what is realistic and what isn't. But you are very clear through all of this that it is done out of love. Like this is a great scene that you really enjoy. Oh, it's fantastic. It's <laughs> phenomenal. I enjoyed every moment of it. And I love that the bus is a hero in the movie. You know, <laughs> it really is a hero in the movie. And buses really are heroes of the city. So I was extremely pleased. And, you know, we didn't mention any of the fight choreography or anything like that, but it's incredible. You know, yeah. throughout the entire scene is incredibly enjoyable. I loved it. Yeah, it's so good. It's so good. Um, Whenever there's a viral thread, there's this joke that people um, are supposed to plug their SoundCloud at the end. But you use that space to encourage people to thank their bus operator. Can you describe why you did that and what that means to you? Yeah, as a bus operator, it's actually sometimes kind of lonely. Um, A lot of times you're not really aware of whether people uh, are even aware that a person is doing this work to, to serve the system. So receiving just a simple thank you actually feels like a little boost. You feel a little bit better in your day as that happens. And I moved to the Bay Area 21 years ago in Oakland and riding AC Transit. An AC Transit operator actually taught me as uh, like a 17-year-old kid, you know, when you get off the bus, say thank you, operator. And I've I've kept that habit ever since. And and now as a Muni operator myself, I'm now trying to make it a habit to thank the passengers for riding Muni. But I do think it it really sort of it makes you feel more human in the operator seat when somebody recognizes that you're that you're providing that service. And so I think, you know, thank you, operator should be the last thing you do as you get off a bus. You can follow Mac Allen at that underscore MC on Twitter, where you can find this whole hilarious thread and so many more daily insights from the perspective of an SF Muni bus driver. Thank you, operator. Invisible was produced this week by Joe Rosenberg. Music by Swan Real. Delaney Hall is the executive producer. Kurt Kolstad is our digital director. The rest of the team includes Vivian Lay, Chris Berube, Christopher Johnson, Emmett Fitzgerald, Lashima Dawn, Jason DeLeon, Martine Gonzalez, Sophia Klotzker, and me, Roman Mars. Special thanks this week to Glenn Washington and Pat Masidi Miller at Snap Judgment and Mac Allen from SF Muni. We are part of the Stitcher and Sirius XM podcast family, now headquartered six blocks north in the Pandora building in beautiful uptown Oakland, California. You can find the show and join discussions about the show on Facebook. You can tweet at me at Roman Mars and the show at 99PI Org. We're on Instagram and Reddit too. You can find links to other Stitcher shows I love, as well as every past episode of 99PI at 99PI.org. Coming up this year from 99% Invisible and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, a new four-part podcast series called The Future Of... I like to say the dot dot dots. We'll be exploring how changes in the way we live, learn, work, and play may shape our health and well-being in years to come. Our first episode is all about the future of the office. It turns out people have been going back and forth about what makes a healthy and productive office since there have been offices. Just to give one example. This is design writer and friend of the show, Allison Arieff. So, you know, Facebook, when they were first emerging as a company, they bought the old Sun Microsystems building in Menlo Park and doubled the amount of people in the same office space. Of course, they didn't pitch it that way. They said, oh, my God, this is so amazing. 
we have all this collaborative collisions and spontaneous interactions because everyone's in here. And then they hired Frank Gehry to design this giant warehouse next to Sun Microsystems. And to me, that building looks exactly like the rows of desks of like little telephone banks that secretaries had in the 1950s. But it was supposed to be so radical and so amazing that everybody was on the same floor and they were all gonna be so innovative. But it's like so retrograde. So I, I think there's, there's always this tension between um, narrative and reality about what the office is achieving. The 20th century was full of misbegotten fads and productivity innovations that continue to this day, even when the whole notion of what it means to be in an office has shifted during the pandemic. This special episode is part of a four-part series we created exploring the future of health and well-being, imagining what the world might look like in the next 15 years. Each episode examines what we've done in the past and what we do today to create a healthier, more equitable future. The future of dot 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 from 99% Invisible and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. We'll be releasing these throughout the year. The first episode on Offices premieres next week. To not miss a single episode, all you have to do is keep listening to 99% Invisible. <laughs>